You say you're a believer. But that next level is such a high jump to get up to be a disciple, to be just a little bit more like him. And a disciple, go, go to the slide, sis. I think I've already got started here. A disciple is one who follows the disciplines of the mentor. Amen. In other words, I can stay down here, and I can be honest with you. As a believer, uh, God, but here's the thing. God's always going to keep trying to pull you upward. He's, uh, he's never going to stop. He's never going to stop. But I believe that just as the thief on the cross was a believer, he wasn't a disciple. He wasn't Christian. He wasn't like Christ. He was a repentant thief on the cross that asked God to save him and was with him that day in paradise. He never left this level. But for you to keep moving and processing your life and moving up and become one like him, you follow the discipline of the mentor. So what did Jesus teach us? He said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. And these are disciple things that, that disciple us so that we can move higher. And our goal is, is to be like Christ. It is to be Christian. It is to hit that place. But I think so often we told everybody that whatever level you were Christian, and we never gave them anything to shoot for. Never gave them anything to keep pressing on to. So, this, you know, when you talk about fasting, fasting releases your potential. Uh, I don't think we understand how much we are weighed down by the food we eat, the TV we watch, the media that we're involved in, the people we hang out with, how much things that pull us down. And, and your potential potency is that which you are. And you're not, you don't see that until after you start uh, uh, shedding a few things in your life or get rid of a few things that are holding on to you. So pa fasting is part of our faith life. In, in a fast, and let me just walk you through this, particularly those watching online, the believer chooses for a set time to do without something that is hard to do without. Some of us, we pick things that are easy to do without. You know, we'll do without a Dr. Pepper. Well, that's not hard if you can go to Coke. Huh? I'll do without a Hershey bar. That's not hard if you can go with a Kit Kat. You know, what is it that you can, can, can say? And I'm not trying to condemn or beat anybody up. I'm just saying you, you're going to have to level up with yourself and say, okay, what is it that I can do here that is hard to do without? This is done so that it does not come between the believer and God. So it cannot act as a God over that relationship and over the life of the believer. So you want to make sure that there, and listen, there's always little idols that are trying to sneak into our lives that try to come between us and God. So we've got to deal with that. We've got to always watch out for it. So usually the fast is to do without food. We understand that. We, we, we saw Jesus do that 40 days without food. Food is one of the great blessings of God in our lives. Say amen. For, oh, come on. Don't you love food? Now, I've, you know, I'm not trying to boast, but I haven't had any today. But I can tell you that just I rode my motorcycle here just so I could smell. <laughs> huh, Jay? You could smell, man. You could pass by and you could smell that steakhouse. We passed off the road barbecue up there. I could smell the pit burning in the back. You know, you know normally you don't pick up on that. But we love food. God created us with this ability to enjoy. And, and we want to eat more. We enjoy it. It's a true pleasure. Uh, it's a necessity. Amen. But we tend as humans to be gluttonous. We tend to press into it a little bit too much at times in life. And, and when we have anything in our lives that we don't or can't say no to, then it's Lord, Lord and over us. But, but Jesus being Lord, if something else takes up God's place in our life, it's an idol. We're living in something akin to idolatry. So we've got to deal with it. Fasting helps to bring it back into enough control for us to surrender it to God so it can never, it can be returned to its rightful place in life. In other words, after the 21 days, you may go back to doing what you quit doing right now. But what you're saying to that thing, whether it was coffee or nicotine or caffeine or a drug or a liquor or a certain food, you're saying that for the next 21 days, you don't have control over me. I mean, you're saying to the TV or so, whatever it is you decided, you're, you're saying to that thing right there, you don't control me, you don't own me, I don't have to deal with you all the time. And once you deal with that, that way, and, you, and after that 21 days, you decide, okay, now I can go back and enjoy some of that. <clears throat> I'm not telling you you can't eat that, but some of you will quit eating certain food. And as you get older, they tell you that your, your appetite changes. Now, I've been waiting on this thing to kick in for broccoli and cauliflower and, and, and things like that, Ronnie, but it just has not kicked in yet. It's just, it's not moved into, you know, and maybe eventually it will. Uh, you know, that you just stop hating chicken fried steaks, but it hasn't happened. <laughs> Biscuits are still a joy. Amen. Amen, those things are. So, so be careful with Matthew chapter 6. We want to pull, pull a couple of verses about when Jesus said, teaching us to be disciples. So when you give to the needy, 
do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they received their reward in full. And again, Jesus speaking of, of the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Herodians, that would often give and announce their giving so everybody else would see it. He said, don't do it that way. He said, give secretly. or That's the wisest thing. Don't, don't, don't boast about what you gave. Verse 5, when you pray, so the first one is when you give. Second is when you pray. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. When you fast, everybody say when you fast. Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, and again, being a corporate fast, we all know that we're doing this, at least the most of us. I mean, so it, it, it helps us in that area. But when you privately fast, so hopefully this won't be the only time you fast this year, you know, there's a private time. I, I like to say that you put all on your head, wash your face, and put a toothpick in your mouth. That way everybody thinks you just ate. <laughs> and then they won't ask you any questions. How, have you eaten or do anything like that? So you keep a tooth. And there's certain ways you can fool yourself that way. Keep a good toothpick around It'll help you. Galatians 5 tells us why we're fasting. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruit, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. Against such things there is no law. Again, look at this and, and let it, <coughs> excuse me. Look, this is what we want in our lives. And, and, you know, when you think about, thank God there's a Bible to tell me and teach me that love, that God is love. That God, came, that, that God came to give us love and to teach us to love one another and care about one another. So the fruit, the fruit that all of us want in our life is love, is joy, peace. You know, when I, when I hear Angela's plea, plea, I hear a woman wanting peace in her life, want to see peace in the family, to see it, it stop. There's, there's something about just having, uh, being able to rest at night. Can I tell you something else? Usually when you fast, you're going to sleep better. You're going to sleep better because those, believe it or not, pepperoni pizza late at night will affect you. Absolutely. And when you learn to fast and do it properly, you, you end up sleeping better. Uh, it's patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And then, of course, here, the word self-control. The Hebrew word for fasting means to cover one's mouth. So it doesn't just simply mean to, to take a moment and, and not eat. It also means to watch what you say. Be careful of your words. Some of you, if you could take 21 days and, and, and bite your tongue before you cuss. You know, and some people, I, I know some preachers will never say that to their saints, but I know you. And I know that a lot of us, we struggle with our tongue. It ain't just cursing. It's gossiping, criticizing, backbiting. And if we could take a moment and just bite our tongue and say, no, no, I'm I, you know what? I'm fasting this. I'm not going to talk about my mama at all this month. I'm not going to speak about my daddy. I'm going to be kind to my wife and my husband. I'm not going to say nothing. Even those knothead, excuse me, Lord, I didn't mean to say knothead. Even those kids you gave me, I'm going to be careful not to God, say anything about them. This I'm going to give 21 days or a month and, learn, and, and just kind of back away from it. Believe it or not, you don't have to say stuff. Some of we think we do. We've seen enough of, of memes on Facebook to tell us that we should always be saying something. But we shouldn't have to always have to say something. So the Greek word simply means to abstain, to pull back from, again, self-control. The Jews were commanded by God to fast. It illustrated their submission to his will. So fasting takes discipline. It takes self-control. And because we're American believers, we haven't been taught. One, one, girl, one lady sent me a message. She said, Pastor, uh, I'm confused. She's new in our church. She said, I didn't think we were Catholic. So why are we fasting? So I was thinking, you know, I, you know well, that's a good question. So I, I, I told her it's biblical to fast. You know, not everything the Catholics do are wrong. Hello? Amen. So let's just be honest here. Say it's okay to fast. It's okay to do that. But that was her thing. She was like, okay, well, I'm, I come out of that religion, but teach me. This is something that should ref reflect the reality in your own life. The Jews were commanded to do it. There are two types of fasting. Full, what Jesus did for 40 days. And you can do it for three days, one day. 
two days, you can take some time. Your body, believe it or not, can make it weeks without eating. Now, you can't make it a day without drinking. You need to drink three days as long as any, any human body can go without drinking. You need to hydrate. Yeah, it's a good time to juice. It's a good time to, to use things like that in your body to help you out. You need to do that. But what Jesus did for 40 days, well, again, water, he drank water, but there was no food. It's extended period. Second is a partial, and we talk about Daniel. We're going to go into Daniel chapter 1, verse 12. Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, which would be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they ate vegetables and water instead of the royal food. Daniel 1, 12 says, Please test your servants for 10 days. In other words, for them, it was a 10-day fast. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that that the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who had ate the royal food. Let me break this down to you. These men were kidnapped. They were made eunuchs. They removed them the ability to reproduce in their life. Such was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They should have been bitter. From what my understanding of is at the time, they had murdered their mom and dad. Their family had been eliminated. They took the healthiest young boys, the good-looking young boys. Uh, you know, they, they, they brought them in. They, they pranced them in front of the prince and the king. And then they took them, and they began to feed them whatever they wanted there. And Daniel remembered from where he came from, and he said, Listen, uh, it was a part of what we did, our right right toward God was to fast and to worship him and we want to be able to continue that and they said well if you do that then you'll get all skinny and then the king will get mad and and then next thing we're going to we're going to have to pay the price for that and Daniel said try us try us give us vegetables and water don't give us the fats and all those things you're going to give all them boys and watch and see what happens in 10 days and they were able to worship their God do what they wanted to do and at the end of 10 days they were better shaped it looked better. And this also brings up this point, that when you fast, your complexion gets better. Because all the oils and the things in your body and, the, and all the things that you've been, and eventually starts uh, coming out. So fasting helps clear you up some too. Amen. And, and uh, you know, just, just kind of keep an eye on that personal sanctity part. In other words, if you've got to use a little deodorant, use it. Because your body will start leaking. It will start pushing out certain toxins. It, you, know, you say, you're crazy, Pastor. You ain't fasting. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, you go two or three days without eating or, or, or stop eating some of that stuff, your body will start pushing it out and getting rid of it. I say, uh, Psalm 69, verse 10, said, I humbled myself with fasting. Fasting is not to get me closer to God. Uh, it's not to get God closer to me, but it's to give, it's to, it's to give more of me to God. It's to it's tell God, you know, there's things in my life here. I want to give more to you. I want to give more time. I want to give more prayer. I want to give more thoughtfulness about it. So that's why I'm fasting. So what is the good of it? It's a valuable aid to personal sanctity. Listen, behind many of you setting sin, behind the ills that affect fellowship, clog the channels of a believer's service, the clash of personalities and temperaments, strife and division, lies the insidious pride of the human heart. Woo! Pride and a too full stomach are first cousins. When you, when you get too full, when you act like you all that, you know, and again, guys, just be honest here. We, we have thrown stones at Sodom and Gomorrah and said, we know their sin, Pastor. Their sin was homosexuality. No, it wasn't. That's what, God was upset with them about something else. You want to see it? Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, Come on. overfed, yeah. and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. So fasting then is a divine corrective to the pride of the human heart. It's a discipline of the body with a tendency to humble the soul. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were overfed and unconcerned. The problems with, with, with us as people is our unconcern. That, you know, I've said this quite a bit. One man asked another man on the street, he said, you know what the two worst problems in America are? And the man said, I don't know and I don't care. He said, sir, you got both of them right. Because I don't know and I don't care. There are two worst problems. We are unconcerned. We don't, we don't, we don't, we, we're, we're fed well. Hey, our gas is a buck 75 a gallon. We, we all that, ain't we? We can eat, man. We got food. We got this. We got that. You know, I, so I went by Valley Ranch, which is over where we live in New Caney. They're putting in two new restaurants to add to the 10 we already got. Used to, all we had was Jack in the Box and Sonic. And I didn't hear nobody complaining. Now we got 
12, like 12 new restaurants popping out. It's crazy. We're so overfed. And that, there are times I will go into places. I don't mean this mean or disheartening, but there are times I'll go into places and I'll look at somebody's plate that they haven't finished yet and I'll think to myself, all I got to do is slide up there and save 40 bucks. <laughs> Excuse me, are you going to eat that? You know, doesn't look like you touched it. We've got, we've got, so, and, and believe me, I, I, if, if I'm in the right company, I'll do it. <laughs> You've done it. Again, here's, here's, here's the statement. Here's the statement, and I, I'll do it with H, and I, I believe you did. Uh, that we live to eat. We live to eat instead of eating to live. We live to eat. Our lives are, are surrounded by what we're going to do and where we're going to go. And, and, you know, uh, it was kind of a set-free moment today when I texted the guys and said, I ain't eating today. No, I ain't, I ain't eating lunch today. Just let them know. You know, I went to the hospitals instead. You know, I'm not, it's not doing it. So, you know, because we, we evolve our lives. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that the break from it is okay yeah. to take a break. Or, you know, sometimes it's not even eating. It's um, uh, portions. You can live a fasted life by just saying, I'm going to eat portions. I'm just going to eat a smaller portion two or three times a day. My mother's diabetic. She has to eat four or five times a day. Little meals in between to keep things right, her, her blood sugar right. So she's had to learn how to, and she's a little old thin, thin thing, but she's had to learn how to eat with little portions like that. Uh, you know, we fast to be heard, uh, to be heard from on high. What, one of the things that, that fascinates me about God is that he seems to have flexible laws when concerning us. In other words, he's not as hard and fast. And don't tell me, parent, that you're so hard and fast, that that's the way it's going to be. It's always going to be that way. And that kid does stuff, and you realize, ah, you flex just a little. I flex. I admit it. There are times I've wanted to beat them all to death. Maybe not death, but close, you know. But then I flex. I flex a little bit. And the youngest one got the least of it. I mean, realize that. Usually that youngest kid, if you're one of them young ones, you're part of that spoiled one. Angela, are you the youngest? Gene, well, there we go. Yep, I figured. <laughs> Ezra chapter 8. There by the canal, I proclaim to fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey for us and our children <clears throat> with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king of, the, of his soldiers and the horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road. This is during the time of Nehemiah. Because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks on him. But his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. Again, fasting is designed to put wings on our prayers. It's designed to drive back oppressing powers and darkness. It loosens the captives. It'll give a, a child of God an edge over the enemy. It, it, it simply means I mean business. I, I've been praying, but now I mean business. I, I'm really serious about this. I'm pulling this back. And, you know, today I sent text out to certain people to let them know that my praying and fasting has a lot to do with them that I'm praying for them. I'm praying and believing God for breakthrough in their life, that they'll get purpose and direction. Not only do I need direction, but they need direction. So I'm asking God to give them direction. You know, and I don't see why you can't do that. Why you can't let people know, hey, I'm fasting and believing God for you and let them know that you're concerned about them. And see, in one text came back to me and said, hey, I'll fast with you on that. I wasn't going to, but now you put your finger on me, I'll fast too. Amen. I think it would be a, a good thing. Fasting often brings pressure for breakthrough to come in warfare, a situation that calls for people of violence. You know, the violent take it by force. You, you sit back all day. If we as a church decide, hey, I'm cool with, uh, with, with empty pews. I'm good with a half-hearted church. Then we'll have a half-hearted church and empty church. But when we get to the place where the violent take it by force, we decide, you know, I'm going to pray for people, believe God for people. I, I, I'm going to go to the hospitals. I'm going to the highways, the byways. I'll compel people to come in. I want to see people get born again. We had a guy that ride, rode with us on Sunday. Uh, uh, and I know, Donna, it's your first ride with us. But on Sunday, it was, it was riding. When I introduced him, I said, I like this guy. He didn't come from another church. I like him. He didn't come from another church. And I don't mean that mean. I'm glad folks that even came from other churches found our church and consider me their pastor and they love this place. I think that's great because you don't always fit wherever you were. I understand all that. I know that. But then my heart, though, is after unchurched believers. Believers that are out there, they don't have a church. They, they have a belief in God, but they don't have a place to plug in. They don't understand maybe fasting and prayer. But, but to see that moment. You know that was, don't you, Angela? 
It's Jack. I saw him in here on Sunday morning. I said, don't you come ride. He showed up out there with us to, to ride with us. Those, those uh, opportune moments, seasons of harvest, those connections that mean so much. You've you got to make them happen when you see them. We fast to change God's mind. Jonah, you know I love Jonah. I don't have time to preach on Jonah, but Jonah is such a cool guy. No, he's not. Jonah's a rebellious religious prophet. That's what he was. Let's be honest. He was religious. He didn't want to do what God called him to do. God told him to go to Nineveh to tell those people that they're in sin, that they're doing wrong, and he's going to destroy them all. Somebody had to warn them. They didn't have warning signals other than a prophet of God. And Jonah, the Bible says, gets in a boat, and he sails the other way. And then God sends a storm, beats the boat up. They throw Jonah over the boat. Sometimes, listen, now let me just throw this at you. Sometimes there are certain folk that are in disobedience around your life that if they'll get out of the boat, the sea will calm down. Now, I'm not telling you you've got sin in your family or your church or your business. I'm just telling you every now and then you've got to throw Jonah's butt from the boat. You need a little calm in the water. You've got to get things a little, you know, you just say, okay, we'll, just, we'll deal. And let God take care of him. And sure enough, he did. He came in and swallowed Jonah with a whale took him to the beach, threw him up there on the beach, left him there. Then Jonah walks in, and again, in my mind, I see this man. He's got these acid-washed jeans. He's got seaweed wrapped around his, his head. The Bible says he has seaweed around him. I'm not lying about that. He's squashing in his sandals. He smells of reek of dead fish, and he walks up to the Ninevites and says, in 40 days, God's going to kill every one of y'all. Hallelujah. And the scripture says they all repented and began to fast. But I dare you to find in the Bible where the Bible says that Jonah told him to repent. He never told him to repent. Uh uh. He didn't want him to repent. He wanted God to kill every one of them. He didn't like them. Look what they done to him in the well. He also knew they were, Nineveh was the head of Assyria, the, the capital. They had decapitated the men, the Israelites. They hated them. They hated them. And yet God was going to give them another chance. You know, you can hate the Iraqis and the Afghans and all these others, and, but listen to me. If God gives them an opportunity, he'll give them another chance. Yeah. He'll allow every man to be saved, and no matter what country they're from, what dialect, what, what culture, God desires for all people to be saved, every Muslim to be saved, every Buddhist to be saved. Amen. God wants to save us all. Can you get an amen? Amen. Amen. So it's important here. God has flexible laws when dealing with us. They declare to fast, all of them from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Somebody asked me, he said, uh, they sent me a message last night. How you doing, Pastor? I said, I'm in sackcloth and ashes after Alabama lost that game. I just, I was in a rep- I, I just humbled myself. And I, I congratulated Clemson. Why do you do that? Because that's the first start in healing in your own self. Congratulate the other team. Be nice to the other person. Amen. It starts healing in your body. Hallelujah. And, uh, it's not that we don't put a a gravestone over us. I don't think we're dead yet. I think we may re- may survive another year or two coming up. <laughs> when God saw that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion, did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Sin is visited with judgment, repentance with mercy. When you repent, God gives you mercy. If you're arrogant, God visits you with judgment. God set these terms, Jeremiah 18. You need to write this down. If any time I announce that a nation, including America, or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. When God defers an evil day, it could mean the salvation of multitudes. Imagine all the people that got saved in heaven from Nineveh because they repented. Imagine if God backs off the judgment that he could have planned on America. You think we're going to escape judgment? With all our wickedness and the ways that we've been and our attitude and and our arrogance toward God, our defiance, you know, we're the most benevolent nation in the world. We've got, and you know, and every one of us adults are praying because we want our kids to have the kind of life we did. We want them to enjoy it. We want them to have children and children's children. We want to see blessing come upon them. All of us are that way. We're praying that. But one day that thing's going to, it's going to go down. So we've got to pray. If you want to fast about something, pray and ask God to wipe America's dirty face. Amen. Amen. God, wipe our face. Forgive us. Forgive us for speaking against our officials. Help us to be a nation that's more uh, uh, unified. I, you know, it has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. There's only one thing going to unite us, and it's Jesus. 
Under one name, just one name, just one name. Just give me Jesus. Give me what, 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 you know what I enjoyed about last night's game? All the players that kept telling the nation and the world about Jesus. Dabo Sweeney, Jesus. Trevor Lawrence, Jesus. Uh, uh, Tua, Jesus. They kept on about God and the things that God does. That's what I loved about sports. And they can't shut them up because they get that mic, you know, it's on. It's on, you know. And they, 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 these are things that I, I love about the good teams like that. When God defers, it's a good thing. We want him to defer judgment. I hope he keeps America going for another 100 years. I really do. Amen. And then sometimes you say, well, I want Jesus to come back. Why do you want to do that? Why don't you just, if you want to get to heaven, just die. <laughs> rest of us want to stay here a little bit longer. All right? We got things we want to do. We got grandkids we want to grow up. We got horses we want to ride. We got routes on Harleys we want to run. We got people we want to win to Jesus. You want to go to heaven that quick? Get. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody holding you back? Okay. All right. You know what I mean by that. You know what I mean by that. God sets the terms. Let's start closing. We fast to free the captives. Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice? This is right after God gets on to him. He says, man, you're trying to fast. To look at, tell everybody, hey, look at you. And then you get mad and you punch people out. That ain't the kind of fasting I want. I want the kind of fasting that, that is going to loose the chains of the injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke. You know, many, many a believer has been saved without being delivered. And, and, you know, through this process of life and moving from believers to disciples to Christians, we, we get delivered. God starts delivering us from a lot of things. There are believers bound by fear, resentment, jealousy, and cleanness, knowing full well that their lives are in full contradiction to the liberating gospel they profess. Fasting gives us a breakthrough. Look at the results. Loose the bonds of wickedness, undoes heavy burdens, feeds the hungry. I misspelled hungry. My bad. Correct that for me. Randa, that's, that's hungry. <laughs> Feed those in hungry. I should have put, ha put hangry. Feed the hangry. <laughs> Amen. Hey, here's, here's, here's just a little, a little uh, tidbit for you. When you're fasting, you got money. You got, if you fast fast food, you got money. You fast, you fast Applebee's or, or, or salt grass or one of them steakhouses, you got, you got rent. Huh? I'm telling you, if you if you learn how to just say, okay, I'm gonna so it's just to feed the hungry and to shelter the poor and clothe the naked. That that's that's what the real fasting does. Amen. The result says, then your light will break forth, your healing will quickly appear, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. So I get God to guard me, and healing's gonna come forth in my body. So let me just say this I'm not praying and I ain't fasting for nothing. I ain't doing this for nothing. Right. Amen. I'm talking to God for a reason, and I'm fasting for a reason. Uh, if I want my health to spring forth. I want your health to spring forth. We've got to have enough, enough health to make it till God pulls us home. It takes us out of here unless he comes again. And again, I'm not rushing him up because I don't think they need us there just yet. Amen. But for, for us here on this earth, God help us to get healing into our lives. And this will do it for us. Just stand. Got you all. When you pray, when you give, not if, not if, but when, and when you fast, when you fast. I oh, we have a proclamation I want us to say together. You can open up your, be real careful with it, like I do. Are you on, sir? Oh, I got you. All right. Oh, yeah, got you here. You can use WD-40. You can use Crisco. I mean, it's just oil. Oil's oil. One thing I like about this oil is it's, hold it. No, it's not quite as fragrant as the other one was. Listen. You need some, Ronnie? Oh. Oh, you got in here before we got. Anybody else need any oil? Came in with that? Right here. Got some back there. Thank you, Ronnie. Jesus spoke to the hypocrites who fast so that other people are impressed. Fast are not getting others to say, wow, look how holy that dude or dude is. That ain't why we fast. Fasting 
you know, even a fast as an act done publicly with others is not about showing non-believers or fellow believers how holy we are. The point is, my relationship with God grows. I give more time toward Him. Now, suffering caused by fast are not an excuse to be grouchy, stingy, or rude. Again, if you get that way, eat a Snickers. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, don't, don't hurt somebody while you're fasting. But understand this, it's also about your self-control. Amen. It's about learning how to control yourself. And give 21 days. You're saying nothing's going to control me for 21 days. And at the end of 21 days, I, I may go back to that. But as of right now, I'm telling you, it's, it doesn't own me. It doesn't own me. And some of you won't go back to anything else. You'll, you, you'll, you'll start a whole new habit. Amen. So together, we take a little oil. Is there a, a proclamation on this sister? Yeah. No, no, there should be a pro, right at the very end. God, you created everything. Should, if it, hopefully it's on there. There it is. We say this, well, there it was. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Quit hitting buttons. There it is. Let's say this together. God, you created everything. Therefore, I belong to you. I submit to your claim on my life. Your care for me is supreme. Your plans for me are great. I am partnering with you in your kingdom. My salvation is sure. My future is bright. Amen. Everybody take a little oil, put it on your head there, anoint yourself. Father, in the name of Jesus, we anoint ourselves tonight. We believe that you give us strength through our fasting. That through our fasting that the captives will be set free. That through our fasting, God, evil will flee. Through our fasting, our healing will spring forth. That through our fasting, God, our children will be delivered. And they'll get direction. They'll find out that life has about purpose. And they'll find purpose. Through our fasting over the next 21 days, God, if we ever have those weak moments, that you'll uphold us. You'll strengthen us. Lord, we'll anoint ourselves again if necessary. But we thank you for this night, this opportunity. We consecrate ourselves as a body of believers. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Give God a praise for you walk out of here. Amen. Amen. Go get your children, particularly your teenagers. H.